And during break, we had a uh, we had a uh, question about the the donation of uh, of the palace in Rome uh, by Constantine, and I want to read a, a passage from from F. F. Bruce. It says, "When he left Rome, and this is in actually 326, was his last visit to Rome." When he left Rome for good after this trouble, and, and, and let, me, uh, let me explain the trouble that he had. He had trouble within his family. Um, there, was some, there was some strife going on. He actually had to have one of his sons executed for treason. <clears throat> that was pretty common, though. And, and, uh, and it was common amongst the best of the emperors. Uh, that uh, one one child would uh, rear his ugly head up. <clears throat> you know, it, in fact, it might have been one of the reasons why he left Rome. But you know, nothing is really said. I uh, I know this. I know this that it was very strategic for him to to make. Uh, Constantinople, his capital. Uh, it was it was so central. It actually tied together the east and the west. What better place than Constantinople? Because all of the trade routes between east and west go through that city. So F.F. Uh, F. Bruce says when he left Rome for good after this trouble, he headed over. Faustus Palace of the Lateran to Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, to be his official residence. This donation was magnified four and a half centuries later into the emperor's alleged bestowal, bestowal on the Pope of the sovereignty of all Italy and the West. By this legend, which was widely believed in the Middle Ages, uh, until it was uh, refuted in the 15th century by Lorenzo Valla. So, so over the course of, of over a thousand years, Rome had taken that position that that was indeed a giving the scepter to the Bishop of Rome, when indeed it wasn't. Now, does that, does that kind of answer your question? Okay. F.F. Uh, Bruce, uh, this is a tremendous work, um, Spreading Flame. It is an excellent work. And, you know, I, I, I am remorseful that this is out of print because it is just an absolute tremendous work. And one of the things that I like about F.F. F. Bruce is he's a, he is a true historical exegete. In other words, there's significance in the writing. And, and he is a, he's a linguist. He's a, he, is a, he is a Greek exegete. And I, and I think of um, a fairly good standing in regard to Latin also. And you don't find too many of those. And, and he doesn't allow his Latin to, to uh, interfere with his Greek exegesis, which is very refreshing, because too many people do. They, they start to um, mold the two together, and pretty soon the Latinism of, of the Western Church becomes the dogma of the, of the Eastern, or excuse me, the, the New Testament Greek. And, and that is not so. Their doctrines were promoted by the Latin Vulgate and not by the Greek New Testament. They shunned the Greek New Testament. The Western Church, at, by this time, uh, in Constantine's reign, they had already had in place, not the Vulgates, mind you, but the Italic texts. And they were using them. 
Now when we see Nicaea convened, we see several things about happening uh, at Nicaea uh, that I think are very pertinent. Athanasius prepares a creed document for acceptance, but it is not accepted. Some of it is incorporated, some of it, and I want to emphasize, some of it is incorporated into the Nicene Creed. But now, also about the Nicene Creed, what we see as the Nicene Creed was not what came out of Nicaea. And I also want to emphasize that. Because it was in development over five councils. That councils would amend it based on something that was going on within the church. And so the, the, the Nicene Creed, which is identified with Nicaea, wasn't completed for five councils. <clears throat> the issues at the Council of Nicaea were this. The being of God and the person of Christ. F.F. F. Bruce calls it the battle of the diphthongs. And let me show you this battle a little bit. Now, I would have uh, just leaned up against the board so that you would have had the, the notes on my back and you could have read it, but, but uh, I, I forgot to do that. <laughs> okay, the Battle of the Diphthongs. And it was the use, um, it was the use of the Greek word, and I'll write it in the Greek for all you Greek exegetes. There they are, right over there. <laughs> okay. Homoousios or That's the English transliteration. Homoousios or Homoousios or <coughs> And this word, homoousios, is to be similar. Oops. To be similar. To be like. To resemble. This one is to be identical with, to, to be of the same nature. in greatness. And that was, by the way, interesting enough, says Eusebius, this was the word that Constantine preferred.
Interesting. I don't see the difference between the words on the right and left there. The diphthong. These two diphthongs right here. Actually, this one has no diphthong. At, well, it is a diphthong. But it was the battle of the diphthongs. And so, homoi usios was what Arius preferred. That, that Christ was similar to they, that he had a similar nature. What that did was that separated him in equality. No, that was... This was Arius. This was Arius. And this was Athanasius. But it wasn't Athanasius. Actually, I believe that Athanasius was looking in a different direction. He did not, but, but what happened was when Arius' group, when the Arians promoted this, all of those who were in, in disfavor with the Arians promoted homoousios. <coughs> and so, it wasn't necessarily, within the council, it wasn't necessarily, this was not necessarily the preferred word, but it was a word that, that Constantine had brought forward through Eusebius and, and agreed on by the council. Now what that did is that, that automatically put those... Uh, Arians in bad stead with the creed. The next step was to see what they would do about it. And that, and that became an issue uh, throughout the church. The church, again, was split. It, it was not split necessarily between these two words. And I, I, I want to emphasize that. There was only about five or six or seven bishops that were on this side. The rest of the 318 bishops were over here on this side. And this maintained, what this did was this maintained the unity. And this did not maintain the unity. So then... It, it supported, this use supported Arius' view of Christ being made. Of Christ becoming God, but being less than God. But being like God and similar to God. Now, truly, you know, there, there is no doubt in the Scripture that, yes, Arius, that was heresy. But he did not do this, did he? He did not deny that Christ came in the flesh. Although, as a result of Arianism, other things emerged that let Gnosticism back into the picture. And I want to emphasize that. That Gnosticism, Arianism, opens up the church to Gnosticism. That it is one of those steps, not quite as far as Marcion took it, but one of those steps that would follow. So this became quite a debate. And these were the this is what this is what the Council of Nicaea settled on. It didn't but it didn't dispose areas, but they sanctioned areas. In other words, they declared him to be a heretic. 
but it did not depose Arius. And, and in a sense, I believe that that might have been one of the issues that Athanasius uh, disagreed with. Because Arius had, um, had propagated a, quite a, an elaborate battle against both Alexander and Athanasius. And so much so that when, after Alexander had died, Athanasius, um, all kinds of, of, of indictment came against Athanasius. Anything from, from, uh, from having more than 20 wives to, to killing Christians to, to you know, murder and extortion and, and robbing taxes from Caesar and, and all of these harangues, haranguing uh, indictments uh, were hurled at, at Athanasius when he was being considered as, to be bishop of Alexander or uh, of Alexandria. And, and as a result, he, he barely was appointed bishop. Remember, the bishoprics were, were elected offices. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a very nice time for Athanasius. And, and it wasn't... A, it, the church then was truly, truly split on, split on East-West relations. And the Greek population of the East was going to go the way of Arius, unfortunately. And the, and the population of the West was going to follow the Orthodox position of Athanasius, except it was going to be modified. And it was going to continue to be modified. And, and that, is, that to me is suspect. But I believe that Athanasius probably in his original creed brought something out very similar to Tertullian, only it supported the Trinity. And so it was more in support of the also the person of the Holy Spirit. And I don't... The persona. Excuse me. Not the person. The persona of the Holy Spirit. And oh, forbid, I almost became a heretic. <laughs> almost. <laughs> the other issues at the Nicene Council. Was, one of them was the canon of Scripture. They began to set up rules for the acceptance of canon. And as a result, many of the New Testament scriptures fell in line. So there was a canon accepted. And it was the canon that traditionally had been also accepted by the churches. But there were still some that would later be in the canon that would be, that were still issued. Related and and those those uh, those by the way those uh, we we discussed earlier in the quarter those issues that that made the canon that that it was that it was a faith that it had apostolic authority that 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 it was it was uh, it was it was heavily uh, reliant on eyewitness that. Uh, Let's see what else was there um, that it uh, that it uh, was uh, that it was accepted by the churches and and so there were there were four major major uh, should I say criteria used developed at this time to view writings to allow them into canon or not. So the canon is not closed. Now, mind you, 
mind you, in a legal standpoint, not in an actual standpoint. And I want to emphasize that, too, that the canon was closed at the death of John. Because with the death of the last apostle, the eyewitness apostle, then the canon would be closed. And by the rules, that was true. By the rules that were set up at Nicaea, that would be true. That the canon actually was closed by those rules at that time. It's just that we, they as a church, as a body of believers, they as the Catholic church, would, would need to review that, those documents that the church was using to determine if they be of the Testament canon or not. And those, that criteria would, would uh, remain uh, as, uh, as criteria throughout the church. Uh, un- unfortunately, guess who was not there? The Bishop of Rome. In fact, there were 318 bishops there. And the only one missing was the Bishop of Rome. Even, excuse me, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to put a caveat there. Only two bishops from Britain made it. The other one couldn't be there. Now, <clears throat> that also said another thing. Being, having a council convened by Constantine, that sent a clear message to Constantine from Rome. Remember, remember this also, that Constantine did a great deal to keep the unity of the church almost too much. And I believe that part of that giving over the palace to the Bishop of Rome was a conciliatory move on on the part of Constantine to try to bridge that gap that was already ever expanding between the East and the West. So it wasn't so much him handing the mantle or the scepter over to the over to the church in Rome or to the bishop of Rome. It was a conciliatory move on his part to bring him into the fold, understanding that he had already created a schism. And the churches were well defined, split between east and west. Thirdly, there were organization issues to be resolved. Now, at this time, it was made that the church in Rome, or the bishop of Rome, the bishop of Antioch, and the bishop of Alexandria would be given the title of patriarch. Now that go, all goes away when the Turks remove the Christian churches. And, and, and that, that's a long story because, because the first Turkish invasions um, in about 800, 900 were, uh, the Christians were allowed to remain but the military was not allowed to remain. But the Christians were allowed to remain and, and conduct their, their business. So were the Jews. <clears throat> the fourth uh, concern at Nicaea was the date of Easter. And this is one of those... Uh, <laughs> 
this is one of those uh, those events that Pelican says the church you know what was it bad about <laughs> was that something important for the for the ecumenical council to consider but uh, but the idea there I believe was in unity and it was decided that that uh, the that all would uh, celebrate Easter on the same Sunday. Now, it, it just so happened that some of the Eastern churches used the Paschal calendar of the Jews, and, and they celebrated it according to the Jewish calendar. And as a result of that, uh, they continued to do their own thing, <laughs> even though the council had said... We will use the we will use the um, Julian calendar to uh, to celebrate Easter. <clears throat> I, I want to just uh, mention some of the people that were um, that were uh, at uh, the Council of Nicaea. Um, certainly the 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 um, Arius was there Alexander um, Osius of Cordova uh, Vitus and Vicentius of Cordova uh, used Statius of Antioch and Alexander of Alexandria. So, so two of those who were declared patriarchs were there at the council. And I think that's pretty pertinent. And those two, by the way, would, uh, would remain uh, for a, a long period of time uh, affiliated with the Eastern churches. And and yet and yet out of Alexandria comes the stronger statement toward um, toward homoousios and the support of the of the triunity rather than rather than a disjointed uh, divided uh, Godhead. <clears throat> Well, yes. Was, was Arius in his uh, heresy? Uh, I'm sure he was looking at certain scripture verses. Was he was he majoring in the begottenness of Christ and, and the interpretation of begotten? I, I believe so. Uh, the, the question is, uh, was Arius uh, looking at the scripture in regard to the begottenness of Christ? Uh, in in where is that in? Uh, in uh, for John chapter one, or or in uh, Matthew uh, chapter, I want to say two. Um, probably, that doesn't mean that Arius was right. After all, he was a he was he was. He was very Greek. I mean, coming from Alexandria, he was a, a dyed-in-the-wall Hellenist. And even though Alexander uh, came also from Alexandria, I think that there was the idea that he had a different understanding than his bishop, and yet he desired very much to be bishop. And so he made that a point and brought it before the entire church because he was the first one with his letter to Eusebius bringing that out I was just wondering, basically, I mean, probably probably I, I would have to read some of the some of the documents in fact let's see I do not 
I do not have the book here, but there's a there's a uh, uh, a book that I have, and I will I'll show that to you a little later. But it is it is uh, it has the the documents that were written prior to Nicaea and the letter to Eusebius from Arius the letter to um, the letter in response by Alexander and, and, it, and it builds that, uh, that documentation uh, pretty interesting by the way uh, but, but I think that that would have some of the substance of Arius's approach to the person of Christ and also his uh, biblical references. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, remember this too. Consider the New Testament and and what form it was. Remember at this time there was no Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Vaticanus, which we had discussed earlier in, 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 in the course. That, that, so the formal texts were not there. And so Arius' use would be very disjointed indeed. Now, you know, did that, did that hamstring? Well, in so doing, one can promote certain passages of Scripture over others, ignoring the others altogether. In a sense, the way the Neo-Orthodox do today. Bart, Boltmann, Tillich, You know, the, the scripture becomes the word of God when it speaks to me. Well, if it's not speaking to me, it's not the word of God. Therefore, I can ignore the rest of scripture and I can concentrate on this passage. Well, that's, that takes sound orthodox biblical exegesis and throws it out the window. Because one all, always considers the entire context. And that entire context is the canon of Scripture. Now, there is no canon at this time. Not one per se. Oh, there's, there's, there, are, there are canons within communities of churches, within regions. What is the church using, for instance? But... Remember, this is Alexandria also. And you have, out of Alexandria, a strong Gnostic influence. You have, probably at this time, the Nag Hammadi text, the library, the full-blown thing of, of, the, of the gospel according to Thomas and all of the other extant, now extant, a, a Gnostic Gospels in this region. And don't you think that that, that had an influence on Arius? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, he had taken that turn, hadn't he? He had taken that Gnostic turn and, and it, was, it was supported in his doctrine. The church had no recourse, but they they took a, a an, an incredibly merciful um, tact with him. They were quite merciful to him. So a lot of that, by the way, was because of his support. Because he had mustered up quite a bit of support for himself in this in this in his letter writing. Now he knew who would be more Hellenistic than others. Obviously, Alexander was not 
all that Hellenistic. If you will notice, Alexandria, Egypt, is coming up again and again and again. And if there's going to be turmoil in the church, it's going to be in Alexandria. So, I think that's highly significant. Look for the bad things out of Alexandria. Look for the rotten things out of Rome. <laughs> the bad things out of Alexandria, the rotten things out of Rome. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Antioch. How about Antioch? Antioch, the Antiochian school was probably as sound biblically as, as any. And they had maintained a very... Uh, a very sound practice of exegesis. Yes, Gordon. Wasn't Athanasius of that school of Bob? Yes. Uh, Athanasius. Wasn't Athanasius of the Antiochian school? Yes, he was. In fact, that's why Alexander brought him over. Because he was of the Antiochian school. He did not want somebody from the Alexandrian school. Arius was from the Alexandrian school. And, and so that also became an issue. Um, it was amazing that Alexander was even bishop of, of Alexandria, considering that he was also from the Antiochian school. <clears throat> Over the course of the next 60-some years, Even though Arianism is condemned at Nicaea, it doesn't go away. In, in fact, um, toward, the, toward the end of, uh, of the reign of Constantine, it was said that he uh, was swayed by Arianism, which that does not surprise me because the later his, um, his grandsons and his great grandsons by and large, are Arian. And, uh, and they maintain that. Uh, at this time, the polity is changing in the realm. And, and by the death of Constantine, the, there's a split in the empire. Ali, uh, Constantine's son, Constantius, Two, I believe it is, um, becomes the the Eastern Emperor, and um, and I'm not the I don't quite have the name of the Western Emperor, but the Western Emperor is taking a back seat to the bishop, and and it is a subtle back seat. It's not. It is. Um, it is on this level that the true social polity of Rome is in the hands of Western Rome is in the hands of the Bishop of Rome. The military polity is in the hands of the Emperor of the Western Roman Empire. Now, mind you, that the bishops of Rome have the palace. <laughs> so, what ha what, consequently what happens is they build a new palace for Rome. Heavy taxes, and they're coming. And the, and the taxation issue in Rome becomes uh, unbearable on the society. You have a society that, that got its economic power and might through a Greek system of, of economy, a Greek system of language, a Greek system of market. And yet, you have the rejection of that of that language. And essentially, a rejection of that market. You also have a, 
a, an empire that built itself on the back of slaves. When everybody becomes Christian and everybody is emancipated from slavery, it has some uh, lingering effects on your economy. So, consequently, the tax burden on the citizens of Rome became uh, quite heavy. And there were problems from outside. The Germanic tribes were starting to move in. After Constantine, it's only a matter of 80 years and Rome is sacked. By Alaric in 408. And it, it, it's surprising. We usually put the fall of Rome somewhere around 700. But the fall of Rome was much earlier than that. It was in the time of, uh, of Augustine that Carthage was actually sacked a week after Augustine died. And it did not return to the Roman Empire. That Rome was sacked well before Augustine had died. And many times, yeah, oh yes, it was, by the way, on, on our way to Africa, we will sack Rome. <laughs> and, and every, every, every chief, Germanic chief, went that route. And it was every ten years Rome was sacked. But this was the first. Yes, this was the first time Rome had been sacked since the the Gaelic or the Celtic sack of Rome in 350 BC. So it, it's quite some time. It, there's 800 years of prominence in the city of Rome and and of free from from those the, that, the military problem. Um, it, was, it was wave after wave after wave after wave of Germanic and, and, and actually Gaelic. Um, the Visigoths, the Huns, the, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals. And on and on and on and on. And it wasn't just military might. It was, it was largely military might, but it was also those coming in and, and settling in lands. The, the system of Rome then became feudal. Essentially, the Western Empire being, being broken apart in little ownerships of land around a nucleus with one of those landowners being the major military might in the area. Now, how did that happen? Well, In the days of the empire, when 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 the when Rome went and conquered and kept abating the the advancement of uh, of the Germanic, of the Huns, of the um, of all of these different uh, groups, uh, barbaric groups, and and mind you, they called them barbarians. You know, maybe they were a, a little bit feisty. Well, they were a lot feisty. But they weren't necessarily barbarians. They had social orders. They had, they had societies and organization and arts of their own that many times surpassed Rome. And I want to emphasize that. Some of the skills of these groups were far greater than the skills of the Roman citizens. 
And so consequently, when they could not enslave those skilled workers, they, Rome, had a problem in their economy. And when they granted them, what they, what they finally did was they granted these groups coming in, they granted these groups coming in lands and citizenship. So they became Roman citizens and they were also skilled workers. They were also skilled artists. So it, it brought kind of an influx in a sense to Rome. But it, you see when it's creating. It's creating a nobility, isn't it? It is creating, and these nobles were the ones that the emperor attached the heavy tax burden to. So guess what? Consequently, he is going to go to his neighbor who he's helping protect from the dreaded barbarian. And he is going to go to his neighbor and extract monies off of his land so that he can send to Rome. By the way, this is not happening in the East. That becomes very pertinent. That, that this system is not being developed in the East at all. That they have an intact empire. They have an intact economy. They have an intact market system. And that is why the Byzantine Empire lasted so much longer than the Roman, than the Western Roman Empire. Because when the Byzantine Empire fell, this was fully feudal. And there was no such thing as an empire there. Although the Bishop of Rome declared himself emperor. But there was no such thing as an empire. <clears throat> this was starting to happen uh, right after Constantine. So, so this, this started to, this decay happened very, very quickly after Constantine moved his, his capital to Constantinople. And, and he died and, and it split between a Roman, Western Roman Emperor and an Eastern Roman Empire per, with the Bishop of Rome as part of the social politic of the Western Empire. And so, consequently, what you have is you have the lack of support out into the far reaches of the empire. And the first thing that happened, the first thing that went, was Great Britain. And all of a sudden, the military withdraws from Great Britain. Well, and I won't call it, I'll call it Great Britain because that's what it is today. Um, from Brittany. And the, and, and the Roman military withdraws and leaves all of this citizenry completely vulnerable to my, my, uh, my ancestors, <laughs> my, my, uh, my, my group, the Picts and the Celts, the Scots and the Irish and the Danes. That's right. That's right. So, so there'll be, you know, there'll be movement of those, of those barbarians, barbaric tribes into that region because, frankly, the Roman citizenry was not well liked. <laughs> because it was Rome that enslaved them. Anybody that was caught in battle was put to slavery. Now, consequently, turnaround is fair play. And so these citizens of Rome became vulnerable to slavery to the Celts and the Picts. And that happened early, by the way. 
That happened very early in Britain. And St. Patrick becomes a slave. Circa 380. Right in about the same time of Augustine. So one of the things that takes place here is a group that are that are raided by the Picts and the Celts. They end up being void of across the channel. And Augustine has no influence in Brittany. And as a result, several people come out. One, St. Patrick. The other is Pelagius. But guess what? Pelagius... <laughs> He comes out of Alexandria. He went to the school of Alexandria. And Pelagius adopts a very Hellenistic approach to remember when I put the what was the next group, what was the next debates, the nature of man. He took on a Hellenistic view of the nature of man. And, and what he exclaimed was this. That man was not fallen. So he, had a, he took on a different view of sin. That man's mind, his mind, his noose, was untouched by the fall of man. So therefore, man, even though he be fallen, he can choose good and evil. Therefore, if he can choose good, then he has no need for salvation because he will be saved. And therefore, he has no need for a savior. Where was his influence? From Alexandria. Where, I mean, where, where did he, he exert his influence? He was a bishop in this region in Britain. Oh, okay. Yes. Now, mind you, that St. That Patrick and him have a great influence on the Celtic Church. Because St. Patrick goes into where he was, he became a slave. And he starts to convert the Irish and the Scots and the Picts. And he sets up all these monasteries and all of these schools right in Ireland. And yet all of this is still going on in, in his hometown, in Brittany. And this group is going out and trying to enslave the Irish, who are now Christians. By Roman edict, what they were emancipated, right? Ah, but this group of Brits, you know, it's like a, it's like all the English. <laughs> this group of Brits actually actually take a lesser view of their humanity, of the Celts, and that the Celts are lesser human. So they can be enslaved. And that was very prevalent, and it, and it was very prevalent throughout the Western Roman Empire. And I, I, I want that to sink in. Because the citizens of Rome that remained back and, and were large landholders, very arrogant. There was a very arrogant group of people. And even though they be Christian, they were very, very corrupt and worldly. And so were the bishops, excepting for a few. Now about the same time, about 360 to 380, comes a man 
named Priscillian in the area of Gaul, uh, in Spain. And he says this, that we have to get back to Scripture, that we have to get back to the Scripture that we have departed from. And he appealed to Rome. Well, Rome's, Rome's response to that was to get the emperor to send troops and the bishop of Rome commissioned the emperor to send troops to exterminate the alienists. And, and anywhere from 10 to 15,000 Priscillianists were killed. And the, and the backdating of those documents, by the way, were stating that they were Sabellianists and they should be exterminated for being Sabellianists. That's the first time anything that rash was by Rome it was yes it was the first time that anything like that had happened in the churches since the persecution yes but it's not far remember this that it's only 360 it's only about 30 years not even that not even 30 years after Constantine is dead and and Constantine tried to tried to unite the churches his desire was at, for the church to be united. It was never to be divided. But the church is well divided, and Rome, Rome is the one who walks away from the rest of the communion. And I want that to be known, that Rome was the one who started the schism, not the Eastern Church. Now, um, that gives you kind of a, a kind of a, a should I say a fast and but but maybe a clear picture of what the future has for for the Western Church. It's going to be marked by feudalism. It is going to be. It is going to be a, a I'm, I'm sorry, but it's a real mess politically. And and this system destroyed the Roman economy. But it was it was the very thing that needed to be done to spread the gospel. Because the gospel was not going to be spread through the arrogance of Rome. And, the, and a new wave, even though it be Celtic church, a new wave comes into being. And by the time of the, of the complete destruction of the Western Roman Emperor, Empire, by the time of the complete destruction, there was a, a very, very, uh, should I say, prevalent movement back from Great Britain into the continent of Europe. And it, and it, and it ends up first in, uh, in Brittany, in Normandy, in, in Lyons, in Paris, uh, in France into Spain uh, and, and then finally reaches Rome. And, it, and it's kind of an infusal of fresh air. It is, a, it is a new wave of evangelism and it's, and it's going after certain groups. It is going after also those Germanic groups who were considered to be barbarians. It's going after the Danes. It's going after the Norwegians. It's going after the Vikings. And the Vikings were out there to kill every Christian. Believe me. That's my other group, by the way. So I came from a, a good sound group of Celts and, and Vikings. <laughs> All right. And let's stop there.